Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this drink tank hosted by Bri Bri Blue with John Curtis MP. Um, um, apologies about moving the venue from the mob of arms as usual to the to the digital uh, world, but um, such, such is the times we're living in. Um, so um, we so um, just to, to quickly run through things. So uh, with Bright, so Bright Blue is a liberal conservative think tank, and we work on a range of projects around social environment and environmental policy. Uh, we are like, if you want to tweet about this event, use the hashtag uh, Bright, Bright Blue, or follow us on Twitter at We Are Bright Blue. Uh, I am myself, Anwar Goloff. I'm a senior research fellow who focuses on social policy, and I will be chairing this event. Uh, but more importantly, uh, uh, having the, we have with us John Chris MP, who is a Labour Party politician who has served as a member of parliament for Dagenham and Rainham, and formerly for De Dagenham since 2001. He's also a former Labour Party policy coordinator and currently a visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, and visiting professor at the University of Leicester, primarily involved with the Centre for Sustainable Work and Employment Futures. He is also the author of Dignity of Labour book, which has been published earlier this year. Um, if you wish to answer questions uh, of John uh, during his talk or afterwards, please use the slider link beneath the YouTube video uh, in which where you can enter your question. And without much further ado, I'm happy for John to begin. Well, um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Anwar, um, for that introduction. Um, and a good evening to everyone. Um, I'll, I'll briefly explain the origins of the book, actually, because it uh, seeks to diagnose and respond to three interlinked crises, really, that I would argue disfigure and threaten liberal democracy and which actually predate the pandemic that had been but have been showcased through the course of this pandemic the first one is one that does concern me as a labor politician and that's the crisis of the left both the global challenges and the domestic defeats of post-war social democracy and tries to account for its pale uninspiring technocratic existence today its lack of moral purpose if you wish the second one is the rise of authoritarian populism that is rampaging across the planet and upending our politics and literally threatening liberal democracy. And the third is the long term, or at least a decade long productivity puzzle and longer term post-war structural UK productivity problems. And I tried to sort of link all of these by returning to quite unfashionable terrain of how labour is understood, how it's rewarded and represented across our economy and society. Um, and this is obviously linked to the pandemic and how this um, has shone a light on the dignity of work and the vocations performed by many of our fellow citizens, often who are seen as part of the left behind. And I basically argue in the book that rethinking a new politics of work based around the dignity of human labour could um, help provide new ethical foundations for the left and re-inspire people again. Um, it could, um, if done correctly, make sure that liberal democracies become more resilient to the threats of liberal democracy. And thirdly, offers a route through our province productivity malaise. Um, the actual structure of the book is divided into two parts. And part one considers um, the three competing economic philosophies regarding human labour that have defined post-war British politics. And I go through it since the war. The first derived from, if you want, classical political economy of Smith, Mill, Ricardo, that informed um, post-war corporatism. The second from the neoclassical revolution of the 1870s that defined the politics of Thatcher and much post-Thatcher labour thinking, actually, uh, in terms of new labour. And thirdly, some of the more fashionable Marxism present, present on the Corbyn left and its relationships to classical Marxism. And I argue that those three approaches to understanding human labour have defined the economics of the last 70 years. And basically within that, I seek to rehabilitate a lost social democratic post-war tradition, a sort of early form of stakeholding that sought to bolt the organised working class into the operation of the economy through the um, promotion of good work and uh, 
you will find no evidence of this tradition on the left today. And I think that's part of the problem. Now, part two of the book, in contrast to three competing economic philosophies, looks at three competing political philosophies in terms of concern for labour issues around questions of justice. Um, the first concerned with maximising human welfare, which is usually meant to mean utility. The second with questions of human rights and freedoms. And the third with more ancient concerns with promoting human virtue. And I argue it's the latter tradition that's lost out in the battles within the left. And consequently, this accounts for our loss of moral clarity of purpose. Um, so the argument is that we need to rebuild the ethical character of the party by rehabilitating the lost ethical traditions, which were there at the origins of the Labour Party, but we've lost. And you can do that by looking at human labour. So just to go through some of the arguments around the left, um, I argue that, I mean, it's pretty self-evident that capitalism looks increasingly unstable and ill-equipped to live, deliver on its promises, yet it is the left that lies in crisis. And I'm always reminded of an old Peanuts, Charlie Brown cartoon where um, Charlie Brown is returning from a baseball game, totally despondent. And there's four slides, one after another, of him looking even more and more morose and dejected. And the first slide, he simply says, good grief. The second slide, he simply says, 184 to nothing. And the third, he simply says, I don't understand it. And in the final slate, he simply says, how can we lose when we're so sincere? Um, how can we lose when we're so sincere? This sort of phrase crowds out the renewal of the left, it seems to me. We can't dig not diagnose our position because we're sort of um, almost consumed by a sort of form of righteousness that sort of gets in the way of proper analysis of where we are. The, the, the American writer George Packer has used this um, Peanuts cartoon in his biography of Richard Holbrook to reflect on the US experience in Vietnam, but I think it sort of approximates the problems facing Labour. We keep losing, we can't understand why, because we are so well-meaning and sincere. Consequently, there's little debate about what the party is for, its essential purpose and character. Despite us losing, um, what is it, four elections in 11 years and fating a mountain decline to win the next election. We lost 2019 by 80 seats. There's going to be boundary changes, um, by-election defeats appear to be regularly coming around. It's a long way to climb. And instead, internal debate tends to cover who's in and out of the shadow cabinet or Keir Starmer's personal performance in the first year, or a few specific votes in a number of red wall seats. Now, I would say um, a lot of this is froth. Um, psychologists would call it transference. Um, so I try, try and pose an argument in the book that Labour could and should rebuild around questions of human dignity um, as we emerge out of the pandemic, specifically the dignity of Labour. Now, you might suggest, um, isn't that what Labour's all about anyway? Um, historically, yes, I would agree. Uh, but over recent decades, it's lost its way. It's been over-reliant on assumptions that the working class are on the wrong side of history, that they're withering away through to technological change, that the robots are coming. But I um, question whether they are or not. There's very little evidence of this. And as the danger is politically, we're writing the working class out of the script. People know it. They feel it, and funnily enough, they're less prepared to vote for us because of it. Um, the uh, French political economist Thomas Piketty has recently talked of the rise of the Brahmin left, the most educated citizens and the greatest beneficiaries of the knowledge economy and our meritocracy have captured left-wing parties um, at the expense of the working classes. Brahmin he uses to mean socially or culturally superior persons. And my fear is that Labour is increasingly drawn from certain parts of society and geographic, geographically certain urban and university towns, by which I mean, I think it's 74% of our membership is from the professional middle classes, especially from London and the South East, social classes ABC1. It's pulling an ever-increasing proportion of our vote share from social classes, ABC1, 
and declining support amongst the working class. I think the latest YouGov polling I've seen suggested a 26 point Tory poll lead, something like 53, 27 over Labour amongst C2DE voters. Um, now, I said earlier that there is little debate about the future of the left. Yet here is the kicker and why I've jumped in in terms of writing the book is that without any debate, a dramatic reset is currently underway by stealth on the left, underreported but highly significant. There is, um, if you want, a new socialist imagination emerging. Um, you hear talk of things like automated luxury communism of post-capitalism where the most fashionable thinking seeks to invent the future it's a form of utopianism that demands full automation a world without work of abundance often financed by universal basic income and where there is no such thing as dignified work anyone who dares to challenge this is often described as uh, right wing in the Labour Party. And it's emerging as a very powerful lobby who self-identified literally as the post-work left. The writer Paul Mason recently wrote that if Labour rejects this vision of a post-work future powers powered by automation, it will condemn itself to oblivion. Um, I just think all of this has to be contested. And that's one of the reasons why I jumped in, um, not to make friends, but to have an argument, really. Now, in terms of technology, automation and the end of work, this new embrace of utopias around automation, post-capitalism, a workless future, um, ensures that forms of technological determinism reappear on the modern left. And it's a form of thinking that has always disfigured the history of the left. It's prone to authoritarian analysis of history. And this is um, this a view of technology um, is a recurring theme, not just with Corbyn, but also with Blair and his analysis of the knowledge economy of the future. We, behold, we appear beholden to talk of an end of work powered by automation, a fourth industrial revolution. And in the book, I go through all of the data and um, contest these arguments and suggest that there is a mass of evidence from psychology, from sociology about the role and significance and purpose of work in our lives. It gives us meaning, is a source of dignity above and beyond material reward. Um, Second, there are evidence that suggests the robots are coming is highly questionable at best. Technology is not destiny. The future of work will be defined by political choices rather than by the inevitability of technological change. Um, if you go through all of the data, there's very little consensus about the future disruption, the end of work. Much of it is speculative, contains serious methodological errors, and we should instead focus on the political choices that confront us as an economy and as a society. Um, I wrote the book before Joe Biden had um, uh, become victorious in North America, but I find it very interesting that someone who would be described in Labour often as a centrist, as someone who is older, who's a Beltway politician in America, is showing quite a lot of agility in rebuilding a coalition between the sort of liberal East and West coasts and the traditional Rust Belt. And at the heart of it are plans to create 18 million new jobs. Biden's promised jobs that can raise a family on and ensure free and fair choice to organise. And I think that's really welcome. Um, I'd actually go a lot further. We hear a lot of talk over here about FDR, the New Deal of the 30s to create jobs. I find more interesting um, FDR's uh, approach in the 40s in his second economic bill of rights, um, his State of the Union address in 44, where he sought to guarantee housing, medical care, education, social security into the country, constitution, beginning with, quote, the right to a useful and remunerative job. And that's where I think Labour should go. A new approach to justice built around the right to be worked 
to be housed, free education, health security, and duty bound to confront the degradation of the planet. Now, the book contains some, at the back end, 20, 30 pages of policy about how you might re-establish your politics of work, what I call a new good work covenant, new national colleges for skilled work, um, such as social care, into respected and well-rewarded vocations that they should be, special covenants for key workers, um, new definition of worker, decoupled from contractual status, a new pandemic reconstruction force, lots, lots more. Um, but it's primarily not about policy, it's about how we think of human labour. Because if I think philosophers such as Michael Sandel have argued that we can only understand the rise of authoritarian populism by understanding uh, questions of human dignity and how it's related to labour. Um, now, many in labour hate the argument in the book. A lot of the new labour crowd and a lot of the Corbyn crowd rejected out of hand. And I argue that there are more similarities between those two traditions than you might easily think. Um, they both remain captive to forms of technological and demographic determinism that paradoxically see victory within every defeat that labour experiences as we get, you know, as um, we have technology on our side, demographic changes amongst younger voters in the sites of growth. Um, I reject that argument. I think um, it's too lazy. Um, we need to return to politics. In terms of labour, I'm not in it to make friends. I just feel compelled to make the argument as the clock is ticking, which questions our future existence as a political party and as a long-standing political tradition. Not least because the Tory levelling up agenda, I think, is a very serious threat to labour. And we have to confront it rather than hand over these traditional communities and seek to double down in our urban new heartlands and university towns, because I think that would be deadly. There's no coalition that can win in those parts of the landscape. Moreover, that is not what the Labour Party was created for. Political parties don't fall out of the sky. They're born out of traditions of justice in terms of um, economic and social advancement, in terms of key um, political traditions, which I think we should neglect at our peril on the basis of highly fashionable but highly contested views of economic and technological and demographic change. So in conclusion, this is deeply unfashionable terrain in terms of how we understand human labour, but I feel compelled to discuss it and make an argument on the left because over time, labour is dramatically changing without us even having a debate about the validity of such changes and that might wake up one day and see that the trains already left the station and it becomes irretrievable in terms of building a coalition anchored around a discernible labor or working class interest so that's why i'm sort of compelled to jump into the debate um, and look forward to any comments or questions that you want to make um, because this is a, a debate that encompasses the changing class compositions of both the left and right in politics. So I think it's an appropriate to discuss it, not just on the left, but with elements of the centre right as well. So thank you very much indeed for an opportunity to say a few words. Um, thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Um, that is for us a very comprehensive and you know, deep and in-depth examination of labor's recent problems and the, the kind of a diagnosis of the issues and the, and the focus on i think worker classes is, is pertinent because uh, because of course that is the fundamental cleavage of the, of the Brit of british politics and it seems to have gone a bit amiss in a lot of debates and discussions over the last at least decade if not for longer and that has now shown itself as as you point out with the tories kind of increasingly Invading what is Labour's traditional turf. Um, so I have a couple. So I, I just have a, a pair of questions to ask myself uh, before we get to the questions um, from the audience. And uh, just to remind people that if you do have a question to ask John, then please do use the slider link below the YouTube uh, video player uh, to type in to type in your question. Um, I mean, first thing I did want to uh, pick up on 
uh, J um, John, is I think the discussion the, 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 you mentioned the East War, which has been quoted quite a bit about how education is becoming increasingly kind of like, with people with high le levels of education becoming increasingly Labour voters and people with low levels again becoming increasingly kind of right wing conservative um, voters. I mean, so I guess my first question to you is, I mean. To which extent is this process really reversible? I know you highlight the, the, the kind of emphasis on war, but there are kind of like very fundamental kind of cultural shifts at play where people where for people for a lot of people increasingly it is cultural issues which kind of dominate their political decision making, not their kind of like economic class or status, which is why you have a lot of professionals and consultancies and investment banks voting Corbyn in 2019. Um, so, so how exactly can you overcome this kind of like shift of emphasis and cultural issues? Well, my um, my abiding concern is the sort of trap game of modern politics, right? Where the the electoral landscape is chopped up between leave, remain, um, and you see these binaries based around young and old, geography urban versus um, suburban or rural or towns. You see it around um, whether they have an education or not. Um, you see these traps. Now, one argument which is gaining ground on the left is to say, well, look, the Tories have become the, um, the party of leave. They're doubling down on these uh, red wall constituencies. There's this blue wall that we should play into. We should play on our own side of the pitch and have this struggle. And this plays into geography and it plays into this notion that our new base is amongst the educated remainers who live in university towns um, with edu strong educations, et cetera. And funnily enough, they're the youngest, so they're gonna be around for the longest. And so inevitably that means that we win, despite us losing all the time. So in every defeat, there's this victory. Now, I find that slightly worrying as a get out of jail free card. You know, what it does is it removes analysis of the problems we face. There's a sort of magical thinking around it in terms of the future. Um, and I'm just very, very, um, I, I sort of put a warning shot around that and it should be incumbent on all political parties to try and build wider and deeper coalitions and not play into these binaries. I think if Labour did, it would never win again because I don't think there's a coalition that can gain and retain power there. So there's a sort of, there's an instrumental reason for doing it, but there's also deeper philosophical reasons that political parties aren't there just to chase and dice and slice the electorate. They are born out of political philosophies that span generations, hundreds of years, and we should be respectful of those traditions and they should not be discarded um, without even debating it. And that is in effect what's happening now. So I brought up, I was involved in the trade union movement, um, the Labour Party was my team, you know. Um, it was seen as the party of the class I came from. I'm not nostalgic about that, but I do think that we should retain a sort of uh, an appreciation and understanding of a political philosophy that seeks economic and social change on the part of that traditional base. Um, now, that's not reactionary or nostalgic or backward looking. I think some of these big challenges around labor are highly contemporary around the gig economy or a failure of inclusive growth. So that that is literally upending capitalism. Its very stability is threatened because it cannot deliver a home, a decent job, a free education. And that is meaning that is becoming highly combustible on the far left and far right. And I think, if we play into these sort of cultural divisions, um, you play into this binary politics, which threatens both the party, but also wider liberal democracy. That's why I'm basically resistant to it. And I don't think you should inevitably write off huge slaves of the political landscape. I mean, what you should do rather than chase these votes is use opposition to reestablish your essential character and purpose as a political tradition, which is consistent with your history, but is not living in history. It's um, 
not living in the past. It is modern, contemporary, and sets out an agenda of justice rather than try and direct policies to cohorts of voters and then go and argue the case about the type of society you believe in and try and re-inspire again. That should be what purpose is politics is, to, to have a competing visions of justice informed by political philosophies on behalf of different groups in society. Um, people might say that's old fashioned. I see it as highly contemporary actually, and actually consistent with the purpose of my party and what I think politics is for. Um, so I make the argument. Now it is one that is not very popular in my party, but I think it's incumbent on us to make these sorts of arguments because the argument is almost happening by stealth, as I say. It's occurring and these decisions are almost tacitly being made without even being debated within the modern party. And that I think is highly dangerous. Um, and it's incumbent on us to stop this process and contest it. Um, and that's the reason I sort of jumped in really. Now, I also don't think it's inevitable that the Conservative Party becomes this party with these voters and Labour becomes this party with these voters. I don't think history unfolds in that way. I think it's shaped by political choices and political agency where people shape history. History isn't shaped by these deeper forces of technology or destiny. Yes, definitely. It has become a bit of a trend nowadays to kind of take, discuss everything, kind of polling dynamics and how much people support and almost kind of creating an image where politicians themselves don't have agency to create change. So yes, I think uh, your, your final point is particularly pertinent. Um, yes, so in terms of questions from the audience, I think it's actually um, kind of like an interesting kind of like follow up to this kind of like political dynamics uh, question um, if uh, from someone who's um, anonymous. If, if Labour can't regain, like, if Labour cannot kind of catch up on this agenda, or the Tories deliver uh, on levelling up as they promise, is there a risk that the UK kind of becomes kind of almost like a one-party state like Singapore for, for a long period of time, whereas the Tories are just so dominant that they're impossible to displace? Do you think that's, that's a potentiality? I think there is a danger of that, actually. I think there is a danger. I think if, if um, Labour retreats into certain geographical communities and cohorts based on this um, mythical deterministic thinking around technology and democracy, demography, then I think it could write in, itself out of the script politically in terms of being a serious national party of governance, because I think it could shrink um, into areas where it wins very big majorities and piles up majorities, but it has no breadth. And that is, and that, I also think it's bad for our democracy in terms of the necessary checks and balances. And I think you're seeing this playing out actually day to day in the government, that we're not having the necessary checks and balances on patterns of behaviour, which are an effective um, uh, opposition um, is duty bound to perform that role. Um, based on the fear of losing power. And I think that it can create a sort of bloated, entitled form of governance um, because of a belief that it can't lose. And it can create a sluggishness, a laziness, and a lack of creativity and agility at the centre of government. So I'm not, I'm not sure it's good for the government or the opposition to get into that sort of state of affairs. Look, we've lost four elections in 11 years. Um, the danger is the internal sort of factional character of Labour means that it can't own its recent victories, let alone diagnose the reasons for its failure because of the internal focus of a lot of the party membership. And it doesn't have an outward looking sort of character at present. And the danger is that plays into the hands of the government. So I do think there is a concern that many of us should share, whether you support Labour or not, um, about the trajectory of politics in this country and the danger of it sort of entrenching a form of one party um, victories almost indefinitely, or at least until Labour decides that it's going to get out from under this and actually try and rebuild a wider 
coalition. And that's why I do think the Biden example should be illustrative about the ability of the left to rebuild coalitions that span our traditional base and some of the newer electorates that we are appealing to. Yes, I think most people would agree that having an effective and robust position is, is important, even if you disagree with it, just as you, as you point out, the issues of accountability. Um, moving on a bit from kind of like the political aspects of it, and just kind of a question about the, the, how technology has, has already changed war and how this is being... Do you, um, and basically, do you think part of the shift in kind of like how how much work is valued or perceived to be valued by, by some people is because of how the nature of work has changed, particularly in a lot of low-paying jobs. We've moved away from kind of factories, which are kind of like, um, which are very kind of like social settings where a lot of work is done to produce something material and physical towards services where a lot of the output is immaterial you know, and often also work is much more individualized. Do you think that has had a significant impact on how people can like value and perceive work? You're muted, John. Undoubtedly, there's been a degradation of work um, over the last 30 years. I mean, I would see, I think a lot of the unfinished business around this is I'm on the left especially, but also on the right actually, is really looking at the legacy of Thatcherism. We, let, let me give you an example. We currently remain attracted to this idea that we're living through a productivity puzzle, right? a puzzle. Now the word puzzle is quite a benign word. It's almost a playful word, but I would argue um, the reason why we use the word puzzle is because the political class is bought into a productivity miracle under Margaret Thatcher, which uh, a lot of the evidence I think would is highly contested about there was some sort of productivity miracle. Arguably, I think it consolidated forms of low wage, low productivity work that has been a hallmark of Britain's post-war and pre, pre Second World War economic um, infrastructure. Um, and rather than it performed miracles, um, which almost spiritual significance. I think it, 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 it had much more troubling elements in terms of Thatcher. Now, I don't think we've had a reckoning around the economic legacy of Thatcher, so that we still describe its effect as one of, of a miracle and our current malaise is a puzzle, rather than we see it as a crisis of work. Let me give you examples. Comparative countries that are higher paid than us, um, more productive than us still produce things they still manufacture things even in massive factories such as in germany in the chemicals or car plants um, we don't we've lost that and we've seen this proliferation of low wage often service-based work um, which has meant that let's consolidate our low wage low productivity um, economic comparative performance and that is what needs to be addressed and i think I think on the right, at times, there's been recent attempts to acknowledge this when Theresa May talked about um, putting workers on boards and she set up the Taylor Review of Modern Employment Practices. I would argue she couldn't carry on with that because her party and the legacy of the miracle thesis around that, she wouldn't let it. Um, similarly, Boris Johnson, at times has talked about the need for a new employment bill and new regulations, but seems inhibited because of the hangover of the Thatcher legacy. Um, and I think that that needs to be confronted actually in terms of our enduring productivity shortfalls based on a crisis of modern work and the need to provide more fulfilling, dignified work for our fellow citizens. Because I think it lies behind a lot of the rage in forming modern politics. And I contrast in the book the way the lives people wish to live with the way they are having to live and the growing disconnect between the two is driving a lot of the backlash, the rage against politics and across the globe is informing the rise of all the authoritarian populist right. So these issues of work are interlinked, not just to the crisis on the left, but also the crisis that's disfiguring, disfiguring liberal democracy. Um, we used to hear about the end of uh, history, let alone the end of work. 
And now history is being upended through this crisis of labour and the inability to provide fulfilling work alongside decent housing for our fellow citizens. And I think this is very dangerous for all people who want to defend liberal democracy, not just social democrats, but also from the centre right as well. So I think I want to push you a bit on this point, uh, because I think if you think about kind of like which kind of voters Labour has lost the most or which kind of voters in the UK are particularly more susceptible to its kind of like the more right fringes, um, they're primarily older voters, voters who are themselves potentially who have were working class, who were in working class jobs but actually nowadays are retired or about to retire. Uh, and it's that, it's that kind of group in particular that Labour has lost very intensely over the last several elections. So do you think change, do you think action on kind of work, work and the work, dignity of work can really gain back those kind of voters who are not actually, who were who identify as working class who wearing working class jobs but who are at this point not actually in the workforce themselves? Yes, I do. I think because those people also live in families and communities that have been disfigured by this crisis in work um, generationally as well as in their localities. And there's a, another point I'd make about this. The rise of the post-work left, as, as they self-identify, <clears throat> I find profoundly troubling for someone who got involved in politics because of the politics of work in the building industry, it wasn't it? This the post-work left are, are now becoming the um, political consultants for Labour, and they are suggesting we are not losing working class voters. We're losing votes amongst older voters and amongst those who have homes. And so what it's producing is a politics based on intergenerational conflict and between those who have assets and those who don't, rather than these deeper questions of justice that I think... I was talking about earlier. And so this post-work left is reappearing in battles against rentier capitalism and against older voters. And I think that is very dangerous ways of chopping up the landscape. So to say that, you know, homeowners in uh, North London are the same as homeowners in Hartlepool, I think is a very, very big stretch in terms of the political coalitions you're seeking to define yourself against and embrace. Um, and I think it's it's a, a dangerous way of these binaries gonna, being reset to, is to focus in on questions of age rather than class, which is what's happening as a way of Labour rejecting the argument that they are being rejected by the working class. Even though we're social classes, C2 Dewey, C2DE with 26 points behind, some of the people on the left are now saying, no, we're not. In fact, we're winning amongst working voters and we're losing again amongst older voters. So therefore our opponents are the elderly elements of society, especially if they have assets. And I just think that is a very big bet, political bet in terms of future strategy to reset politics around, around, around that um, division rather than ones more historically defined by class and social and material interests. Yes, and also quite likely a losing bottle considering both <laughs> yeah. the number and turnout of older and, voters. And also, yeah, as, as, there's also the question of self-interest in terms of who actually votes, but it's um, building those antagonisms against people who have worked all their lives their whole retirement is built around their dignity of labour. Seems to be a highly dangerous political judgment and ethically highly questionable as well. Yes. So we have another question from the, the audience from another message, which has been more contentious. Uh, do you think Keir Starmer is the right leader to um, guide labour in adopting this kind of an agenda on Bork? I find this is a very interesting question because I didn't support, I don't know Keir Starmer very well. I, I didn't vote for him actually in the leadership elections, but he's the same age as me. 
and um, he's the son of a tool maker and a nurse um, who was part of the generations that first to go to university in his family, I think, like I was, um, part of a highly mobile, socially mobile group um, in the sort of mid post-war era. Um, extraordinary mobile. Um, secondly, I would simply make the point that he's obviously inspired by something became, before he came into politics. He gained a worldwide reputation as a defender of human dignity, should we say that, in his opposition to the death penalty. Gained a, an extraordinary reputation as a defender of human rights. There was something that really inspired his politics, gave him an animated purpose. I think he could do worse than speaking to the agenda that inspired him before he became an MP, because arguably um, that's not as evident as it should be, that sort of purpose. And I would want him to speak to that agenda. And when I talk about the sort of 44 um, FDR agenda around new economic and social rights, an international human rights lawyer could be precisely the advocate of such an agenda going forward. So I think the third point I'd make is patently he's in it for the right reasons to make, he's not in it for money or, you know, personal advancement. I think there is a sort of ethical core to him. So cumulatively he could be the, an excellent sort of carrier of a new inspiring left politics. I just think he has to, speak to what inspired him before he was an MP and also use the next period to rebuild a public philosophy. This is not about policies, it's about a, a public philosophy to inspire the left again that is anchored in his sense of justice. So these aren't abstract intellectual debates, they are, they are key to successfully rebuilding a left politics in this country. And he could well be the person to do it, I think. That's a very unfashionable mm. view in terms of those characteristics, but I think it's an argument that is, should be made more um, about him being the type of person who could speak to a sort of radical economic and social mobility, once again, a, a sense of intergenerational advance um, that inspired my family, and I'm sure his. It's quite a, quite a comprehensive answer on that. And I think a very uh, a follow-up question, a very similar topic from Daniel Dipper, is where he believes that Labour can actually make this policy transition, considering kind of the, the ideological disagreements that you've highlighted, between, particularly with, with the new left, and whether that's something that will take how long that might take, you think, do you think? Well, that's the big question for me. That it really is the big question. Um, you know, you see across the globe, social democracy um, in crisis. Uh, people are taking a, 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 a sort of thinking with the demise of Trump, that things are looking better. But if you look across mainland Europe, what's happening in Poland or Hungary, what's happening in Spain, um, Italy, France, but with a few setbacks for the far right Spain, uh, sorry, France the last few days, across Scandinavia, um, I don't see the left on the move, should we say. Um, you know, there's no inalienable right for political traditions to exist. They have to re-inspire and re-establish their a telos, a purpose, once again. And that's what is why I go into these competing theories of justice in the book, because I think you can account for Labour's soulless character through paths not travelled in terms of different ethical traditions that have always been part of the left, but which have disappeared. And that is what needs to be rehabilitated. And I do think Starmer could be the guy to speak to those traditions. Um, the danger is we are just sort of crowded out by these technical questions about which cohorts we, of voters we're chasing and which policies appeal to them and what the focus groups stay. I'm afraid um, those moments have passed. This is of a deeper fundamental question about the character of 
the modern left that needs to be answered before any questions of policy uh, will become appealing. Policy is only works when it's illustrative of the deeper sentiment that you've established about who you are as a political tradition. That's what needed again. I don't know whether this is retrievable. Um, that's partly why I wrote the book, because I'm going to put my two penneth worth in. What we have to do is crack open a debate around this stuff, because it cannot just be decided without even it being debated. That's my central concern here. Um, the jury's out about where how this plays out. Um, we shall see. I'm sure there'll be debates in the weeks that follow, um, partly triggered by uh, by-election results and, you know, um, we've obviously had a difficult time in Hartlepool. We didn't do too well in Chesham and Amersham. We have the Batley and Spen by-election coming up this week. These are, you know, these are signifiers of where we are. Um, in the aftermath of such defeats, I don't know what happened in Batley and Spen, we have to take the opportunity to rebuild the character of the left. That is my central concern here. Um, my thing is, we, the, the choice it seems to me is either we choose sides in these binary things of leave, remain, urban, suburban, young, old. We either choose sides or we go bigger and have a bigger vision that can inspire people, which hopefully could attract people from all ages and classes once again. And I prefer the latter strategy, but that might be too big at the moment in terms of an objective. We shall see. Um, anyone who knows the future, just ignore them, because this is, this is, um, you cannot uh, know what the months and years lie ahead for the left. Um, it's in our hands to decide it. Um, so I don't think there's any use in really projecting the future here. We should try to shape it. Yes, and you mentioned uh, the decline of or challenges that a lot of social democratic parties are facing across the world, particularly in, in Europe. So we, we, I have a, have a question, not a question from the audience, particularly around that, uh, where we're, um, where we're a labor that's more refocusing the kind of social democratic principles uh, you, you're focusing on, would their foreign policy would need to be, would inevitably entail being closer with the EU and the broader social democratic movement to bring up some of the Brexit debate back into this? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, and it's sort of, it's, Again, another path not taken at the moment in terms of going to, I would, um, I'd be very interested to see where Lisa Nandy goes with her book that she's writing on future foreign policy for the left. Hey, you rethink it in line with, I think there are debates to be had around the future economic and social rights as I've intimated, linking it to questions of human rights and trying to learn from the post-war traditions and the inspiration between behind human rights thinking as we, as democracies were threatened by totalitarianism and on the left and right and fascism um, and the humanism that created post-war human rights thinking. I think given the technological challenges we face, given the totalitarian challenges we face, there is a big agenda of rethinking human rights again um, for the future. And I think Lisa will, be doing that thinking now, linked into Europe, but on a wider canvas as well, in terms of international human rights, um, international treaty obligations, rethinking um, a rules-based international order where Labour and Britain sits inside that. What is Labour's vision of a post-Brexit Britain is your question. And uh, I think she will step into that breach because that is... Um, a bit of a vacuum at the moment, but one that can't be left indefinitely. Labour has to step up. And that's the way you acknowledge the election results of Brexit and the election results since then. 
by resetting your own agenda and reimagining um, the purpose of social democracy in a post-Brexit world of a challenging international order and they need to reset human rights and rules-based systems given the authoritarian challenges of our time. Now, that's a big agenda, but it's also a great agenda for hungry I'm older now. I've been around the track a few more times, but we're looking to some of our younger generations to pick up that and have some interventions commensurate with the challenges that confront us both as a country uh, and as a planet linked into the environmental challenges. There's a big agenda there for the left if if we have the capacity and the wherewithal to jump into that space. I mean, I think I'm looking to people like Lisa to do that in the months ahead, actually. Thank you, John. I think we have time for, for one more question. And I think the, it's a it's another question um, about you, know, you, you about kind of like the broader Labour Party debate, but you, you mentioned multiple times the, the need to have this discussion and debating Labour Party. But actually quite a few people who argue that actually the problem with Labour is that there's too much in like in inward looking and those are all discovered navel gazing. And that actually what needs to be done is much more what the Tories do, which is have that have those discussions in a much more explosive and rapid, but also decisive manner, as we've seen over, over Brexit, and then and then simply go on and, and providing a agenda like the level of the without necessarily having the actual full internal debate in detail. Um, do you think there's any any truth to that argument? It's a good it's a good question. I don't think. I mean, the sort of the shock doctrine, the jump leads put on the party because of Brexit and the sort of uh, the clear out that followed and the uh, um, was certainly audacious. But that was the product of a, an existential threat because of UKIP, Brexit, etc. that threatened the very foundations of conservatism and, and inspired such a sort of quite shocking response which is brutally effective very, it was very impressive um the trouble for labor it doesn't quite realize to me the scale of the problems that confront it you know um so consequently i don't think anyone would be inspired by such a uh, form of response even though there might be a case in a few years' time for more and more people realising the situation we're in demands some sort of dramatic reset. Um, look, we have, a, I think, yeah, there are differences between Labour and Conservative, and the Conservative Party is, is less interested, interested in why it seeks power and more interested in ensuring that it has it. Um, and that's not necessarily in the interests of the country, I would suggest, uh, at all times. In contrast, you could argue that Labour is um, more interested in why it wants it than how it gets it, and that's maybe the difference between the two parties. Um, I think, I think that the, the scale of the problems confronting Labour means that it has to go into the deeper water about mm -hmm. its purpose before it can deal with sort of policies and specific parts of the electorate in terms of you know, building policies for certain cohorts because the challenge is much deeper. Um, if we lose in Hartlepool and Chesham in the ways we are, the danger is it's not about rebuilding coalition. It's being chopped on both sides of it now and shrinking. It's a sense that the walls are coming in and the ceiling's coming down if you sustain such defeats over time, which could precipitate a crisis that threatens Labour as a, a national party of a prospective party of government, national party of government. Um, and these are very, very big questions facing Labour. We don't we don't debate them and there is no solution that does not involve us working our way through these deep waters. Um, there's no short term solution that can swerve around this sort of uh, Reckoning, I'm afraid. Um, I wish there was, but there's no way around it. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for, for your time uh, today and to talk.
and for talking through uh, your book and your thoughts and for answering all these questions. Thank you very much. Um, I think it is here where we will just wrap up. And I think one thing I will mention, uh, two things I'll mention. Good. Thank you very much for joining us uh, from the audience. Hopefully next time, hopefully, but you will you never know, we will host an, uh, the next Ring Tank in person, but we're living in certain times. Um, if uh, you wish to become a member of Broadly, since Broadly is a membership organization, uh, then I do suggest that you visit the Broadly website and join that way. And I hope everyone has, has a good evening. And once again, Joe, thank you very much for joining us and speaking today.